Good morning, Victory. Man, it's good to be back. Y'all miss me? Stop lying. Look, today is not about me. It's about God, right? How many of y'all know that Jesus is alive? How many of y'all know that the Word is alive? What I want to know is, are y'all alive today? Are y'all alive today? Are y'all free today? Look, man, it's time we don't tell God about our problems. We're going to tell our problems about God today, amen? I feel like somebody's going to get set free today. Y'all in the right place. Let's go. And I was buried beneath my shame.
minds. Gotta keep our focus on you. Nothing else matters. Lost in your mystery. 
this moment, we just pray, God, that you would just continue to keep our focus on you, God, no matter what anybody's going on in this room, it's the problems, the circumstances. Father, teach us to fix our eyes and our thoughts on you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this. I don't know how I can go after that. No place I'd rather be than right here with you. And right here with you. You can go ahead and take your seats. I'm John. I'm your host today. And as we prepare for our tithe and talk, I've just got a little message for y'all. It's been on my heart. How much do we trust our Lord? How much faith do we have? Jesus said, in this test me, give of your first fruit and I will repay you tenfold. How much do we trust the Lord? How much do we have faith that he will provide? It's something I struggle with every day. It's hard when you work so hard every day for that money to let it go and trust. This church provides a lot of support for our community, for those communities outside of our submissions. The only way you can do that is through tithing offering. And I just ask you to open your heart Examine where you put your faith in every day. What do you put your trust in? I mean, we all work, we contribute to retirement. I'll tell you right now, I look at my, my, my monthly bills and that's amazing how much I spend, how much faith I put in McDonald's and Burger King. Can you tell? How much better if I take some of that and give back to God and support those who need it? It's a challenge I give to you. Look at how you spend your money. Look how you spend your time. And how much of it do you give to God? He didn't ask for it all. Just a small percentage. I call the ushers for it. I'm going to pray over them, and I'm going to pray over you. Dear Lord, thank you for the many blessings you continue to rain down on us each and every day. There's just so much that you provide for each and every day that we just take for granted. But I also know that there's a lot of pain and suffering in here. And we ask you to continue to put your hand over those individuals who are suffering with pain and illness and separation from family members, and we ask for your blessing on them. And we ask for your blessing on this offering and what it can do out in the community, what it can do to build this church and make it a strong and impenetrable edifice that evil cannot be can enter this building. That your children are protected when they come to this place. Because you are here and that no demon will prosper in this place. Just bless us. Bless the vision that our pastor gives us. And continue to give him strength as we move forward. In all this, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Oklahoma. We're so glad you're here with us today. If this is your first time, please fill out a Connect card, which is located in the chairs behind you. If you have kids, please check them at Victory Kids, which is located behind the main stage. Stay tuned for the rest of the news. If you are a student in 6th through 12th grade, we invite you to come join our youth group every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Please join us for our fun game, amazing worship, and an inspiring message from either myself or J.D. Schulte. We hope that you can join us. Hey guys, if you're interested in serving but don't want to be in the spotlight, please sign up for the media team in the foyer or talk to Danielle Calloway. The media team includes lights, slides, and the news. We'll have a great service. Good morning, women of victory. I'd like to invite you to a clothes swap that we'll be having on Saturday, March 28th from 1 to 4. Bring unwanted clothes, jewelry, shoes, hats, scarves, etc. We'll have a little devotional, we'll have refreshments, and we'll be doing some free shopping. Also, we'll have a Priscilla Shire simulcast Saturday, April 25th from 8 to 3. Doors will open at 7 o'clock. The tickets are $15 a piece. Will be drawn for door prizes and breakfast and lunch will be served. For more information or to purchase tickets, please see us in the foyer after service. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey there. Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. That's all we have for the news today. If you want to stay up to date, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the service. That's all, folks. How's everybody doing today? Wonderful. Awesome. So glad to see everybody. This is a wonderful day. How's the weather? You guys loving that weather? Yes. Mm. No? Who said that? Get out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. Uh, I know there ain't many days left, so you got to let us have a few of these, okay? Because pretty soon it's going to be terribly hot and then you guys can be happy. But uh, I'm really, really excited. Uh, about what, what we're doing today. A couple things real quick I wanted to share with you. Uh, one thing, the um, Priscilla simulcast, uh, just for clarification, tickets are 15, one five, not five zero. Okay, because I, I kind of heard five zero over there and I was like, no, 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 one five, okay, $15. So would love for y'all to come out. Uh, it's for the ladies, uh, you men stay home. Uh, unless you're coming to serve, and then you can come and help. But uh, it's for the ladies, but it's going to be a great time. They did this last year. Really awesome. They, they got a lot out of that, so really encourage you all to come out for that. Another thing I want to share with you all is yesterday we did a men's serve day here at the church, and it was awesome. But I got a question for you. Did anybody notice anything about the front of the church different? All right, she, she wins right there. Melissa, get, get that uh, prize to her. Uh, yes, we got the new sign. So if you guys didn't notice, up at the top of the church, uh, it, it looks the same. It's the same sign, but it's a new one now, and it's painted, and it's looking really good. So uh, the men hung that. They pressure washed the front of the building all to get ready for Easter. And uh, it looked really good. And we got a few other things. Uh, most of you probably didn't notice the change in the hallway in the back, but um, my, my dear friend Charlotte noticed because she's been bugging me for about six months to get that done. So now it looks really good. So we're really excited. But the men did a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, if you don't notice or if you haven't noticed, 
uh, the hot water is working in the bathrooms, uh, so I know y'all are going to love that, right? Yeah. Uh, so we got all that stuff fixed, but it was really great. We did a lot of work, um, some things to the church that we've been needing to do, and we spent a good part of yesterday doing that. So let's just give those men a round of applause. Can we do that? For you? Yes, indeed. Super awesome. I love their heart. They spent the whole day, took away from the families, came here, did a lot of good stuff, so we're really happy about that. Uh, before we get into the message, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I want to thank you for this day, Lord God, because I know that, Lord, you have a, a, a purpose for this message you have given me. And I know that there are people in here that, that need to hear the, the truth that you have brought, Heavenly Father. So I just pray that they're ready to receive, that their hearts are open. And, and Lord, we just thank you for how much you love and care for us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a question for you <clears throat> If I say the word sacrifice, what would you think? Give up. Jesus. Easy answer. That was too easy. Jesus. Uh, some of the things I think that we would think about, typically, if you just ask an ordinary person, hey, sacrifice, how, what would you think of? A lot of people would, might think of the military, right? Yeah. Or you would think of police officers or maybe firemen. You know, those, those people that... that actually sacrifice a lot, even up to their own lives, for the protection of the rest of us. If you're a parent, you might even think of sacrifice uh, when it comes to your children, right? All the things you've done in their lives, or, or the things you're still doing for them, and how many times you have sacrificed, you know, financially, sacrificed of your time, sacrificed of your emotions, because we know that's a sacrifice at times, right? So that, uh, that could come. But you can, might, might even think about maybe in uh, the workforce, those of you that, that work, you could think about how that can be a sacrifice. Now, for instance, before I, I went into the oil field industry, I was in the military. And both of those required a sacrifice, especially as it, it pertains to my family. Because I can't tell you over all those years in the military and now, I, mean, I was nine years in the military, I've been 18 years, almost 19 years in the oil field now. I cannot tell you how many birthdays I've missed or, or anniversaries or Christmases or just get-togethers, you know. Uh, kids are uh, in a play or, or they're getting re awards at, at school and I miss that all because of the job. But of course there's reasons why we do those sacrifices. Oftentimes it is to provide for those, some, uh, so those family members that you are actually sacrificing, right? So those things are all good and that's that's pretty normal list. I think most of us might come to uh, one or two of those or maybe all of those, but it's kind of a small list. There's For sure there's more. Most of you could probably think of things that I didn't even think of. For instance, Bible scholars have often wondered how old Isaac was when his father Abraham took him to the top of the mountain to offer him as a sacrifice. Through careful study of the story as it relates to the Old Testament, based on the following facts, Isaac was old enough to understand the ritual of sacrifice. He was old enough to carry wood for the fire to the top of the mountain. And he was old enough to notice that they weren't bringing an animal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, they, they believe that Isaac's age at that time was greater than eight years old. Right. Yeah. But they also say that they conclude that he was younger than 12 years old based on the following facts. If he had been older than 12, he would have been a teenager and it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. You're going to get it in a second. <laughs> it was a joke. The teenagers are like, that's not funny. <laughs> hey, got it. Welcome to the party, Jason. <laughs> All right. In the Old Testament... Uh, they list, list different types of sacrifices. And, and I want to, uh, just to kind of give us a basis of what the Bible um, talks about and, and how it's 
changed. I, I want to look at these these sacrifices. Uh, they they called them offerings, and they, they talked about in the Old Testament. So we're going to look at the five. The first one is the Ola, which is literally an offering of ascent. It's commonly was referred to as a burnt offering. The purpose of the burnt offering was for the general atonement of sin and an expression of devotion to God. The offering could be a bull, it could be a sheep or a goat, or it could be a dove or a pigeon. The, the burnt offering was most likely the first type of offering ever because it was actually listed in Genesis in the book of Job, the first books. Now, the second type of offering in the Old Testament is the mincha or the grain offering. This was a voluntary expression of devotion to God, recognizing his goodness and his providence. So generally, this was just cooked bread. It, it could have been baked, it could have been grilled, fried, roasted. Uh, it could even have been made into cereal. Though it was always seasoned, it was unsweetened, and it was unleavened. Now, unlike the burnt offering, only a portion of the grain offering was to be cooked because the remainder parts were given to the priests for their meals. Now, the third is the shalom or the peace offering. This, uh, this was discussed in uh, Leviticus 3. It included a thanksgiving offering, a free will offering, or a wave offering. And it could be cattle, sheep, or goat. It could be male or female, but it had to be without def defects. It had to be no defects in it. Uh, if, if it was the thanksgiving offering, it could also be a variety of breads. The purpose of the peace offering was to consecrate a meal between two or more individuals. And it, uh, they shared this meal as a sign of fellowship. And they also prayed for, for blessings in their relationship. The portion that was not eaten on the day of that fellowship, they could only keep for one more day. After that, they had to burn the remains. The fourth offering was the shakta, or literally sin or sin offering. Now, this is, it was sometimes seen, uh, uh, seen as an offering for an atonement for unintended sin. And, and so similarly, they, they kind of looked at it in the same light as a guilt offering. But it was an atonement offering, and it contains elements of the burnt offering, but yet it still had some elements of the peace offering. It was a little bit of a combination of it. But some of the sins for which one needed atonement were not moral sins, but they were uh, more of a uh, matter of ritual uh, impurity. So they actually, uh, people have proposed that they, the name be referred to as a pur purification offering instead of a The primary pur uh, purpose of this offering was not to atone for sins, but rather to purify oneself for entering the presence of the Lord. I wanna, I wanna pause there for just one second. As I was, uh, I was reading over my notes this morning, I was preparing, and I was reading through that section right there, and, and, and God kind of paused me. He stuck me on that for a second. And, and I was praying about it, and I was trying to understand, because it seemed like he was, he wanted me to, to understand something about that part I understand it about myself. And this is, I'm just speaking of myself right now. And maybe you're in the same category. Maybe you're not. But it, it really occurred to me that even though this is, it, it, it's talking about what they did. Now, by no means am I suggesting that that's something we do, that we should start doing some sort of offering before we go before the Lord. Uh, that's That wasn't the point of it. The point was that he was trying to remind me, though, how important it is that we go before the Lord with the right mind. Yeah. You see, oftentimes, too often, uh, I'm very, I guess maybe even nonchalant or flippant when I come before the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, sometimes I don't pause to realize who I'm speaking to. 
And sometimes I, 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 I'm, I'm just so nonchalant about it that it's, yeah. it's like it's a, just another one of my buddies at work. Yeah. And, and yes, God wants to be our friend, and, and that should be a very important relationship, but we should never lose sight about who he really is. And a simple scripture like that should cause us to pause and say, where is my mind? More importantly, where is my heart? If I'm going to go and start speaking to the Lord. And I, I spent 15 minutes in there just praying about this one little scripture that he just... He just really wanted to remind me that he loves me. He wants me to love him. He's my friend. He wants me to be friends with him. But man, we can never forget who he is. Never forget that. The elements of the purification offering could be any of the elements of the previous three, uh, first three offerings that I spoke about. But unlike the peace offering, it was not shared by one offering the sacrifice. Now, the fifth and the final offering was the asham, traditionally translated guilt offering. And, and this one, it, it might confuse us because we have a, a, an English definition of guilt offering or guilt that has to do with the conscience. And that's not what they uh, considered it. That's not how they looked at it. It was actually uh, when you owed somebody on account of sin. Now, that's going to sound really strange to us. Because I don't think there's anybody in this room that would consider that, that they did something sinful to another person that, that they should then pay them. <laughs> right? We just don't think in those terms. Uh, but they took sin very seriously. And that's one of the things that they did is that when they sinned or they, they trespassed against somebody, and that's another word for this is a trespass offering or the reparation offering, uh, they had to make reparations for that. Um, and there was a specific monetary value to that. And they could pay that, they could pay what they owed on that debt of sin in silver rather than sacrifice in a ram. But in addition to that, 20% fee was assessed to go to the priests who mitigated over the, the things. I was thinking about, man, if I just start charging y'all 20% every time y'all sin, I could quit my job. And... No, that's not true. You guys are so awesome, I'd probably starve, right? I'm sure you would agree, though, that ultimately the sacrificial system was flawed. And it was never going to atone for the sins of a person's life fully. In, in other words, um, it would never repay the debt of the life. Lucky for us, our Lord and Savior had a different plan. Amen. And it was his willingness to provide this ultimate sacrifice that would do away with all of the Old Testament offerings. Now, we're going to continue reading. If you've been with us, you know we're in the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles... Took to the uh, turn to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to go to chapter nine for our scriptures this week. And as we as we uh, talk about that, we're also going to uh, we're going to discuss what that means um, in three points. I'm going to have uh, let's call those some um, truths that we're going to get from this different scripture that we can apply to our lives. Three different. First one I want to talk about is he is our redemption. He is our redemption. We're going to begin in chapter nine and verse 11. We're going to take that to 15. But Christ being come on a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean 
sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first statement, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, redemption simply means that uh, it it's involves bringing liberty to a captive. Easiest way to say it. But it's usually through the payment of a, of a price. Now, this would have made sense to the audience of this book. In the, in the Old Testament law, it states in Leviticus that the Israelites were required to buy back a family, a family member um, if they had been forced into slavery. See, what happened back then is that if you couldn't pay your bills, then you had to enter into slavery to pay back that debt. There was no assistant living. There was no food stamps. There was no free cell phones. There was none of the stuff that our government gives to individuals that don't have money. They didn't do that back then. You paid for yourself. If you could not pay for yourself, you had to go into slavery to pay for it. Now, that was the general law. That's how the people worked, all the peoples. But what God had told his chosen people was, yes, that may be the law, but what I want you to do is pay for those people. In other words, you provide a way for them out of that, and you help them as a family member, you come together. But it also stood true for land. If, you, uh, if, a, if a family lost their land because of poverty, they were also required to try to help them get that land back to pay for that. The Webster Dictionary defines redemption as the act of making something better or more acceptable and the act of exchanging something for money, an award, etc. But it also states this. I, th I found this very fascinating. I was so pleased to see that it says that. It actually then says Christianity, the act of saving people from sin and evil, the fact of being saved from sin or evil. I, I really hope you guys see the beauty in that. Number one, that's the Webster's Dictionary, secular book. And it's telling us something about our beliefs. And they got it right. They got it right. You see, they said it's two parts. Well, is that true? Of course it's true. Because there's a scripture that says the exact same thing. And it is probably the most famous, well-known scripture in the Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you see the similarity in those two statements between John 3.16 and what the Webster Dictionary is saying? They're saying the same thing. They're saying it's a two-part act. The first part is the act of saving people from sin and evil. That's God's part. That's God's part. The act of saving people. You see, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was his yeah. part. Yeah. He gave his son. That was the act of redemption. Yeah. We are redeemed first by God because of love. Yes. What 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Well, 
Pastor, why are you comparing redemption to love? Because you can't have one without the other. It's as simple as that. You cannot have redemption without love. It said it in his word. It talks about his extreme love. And it was extreme. That we are redeemed. The very first part of that is for God so loved the world. It started with love. You would not have what you have if God did not so love you. He would simply have sat back and said, you know what? I gave you the perfect world. Y'all messed it up. Figure it out on your own. You figure your way out of it. You got yourself into it. Figure your way out of it. That's not what he did though. Not only did he love you so much that he provided it, but Jesus loved you so much that he went through it. Why would he humble himself? Why would he sacrifice himself in a horrible death all for you? Because of love. Because he loved you. Redemption first starts with him. The second part of both the Webster Dictionary and John 3.16 is the fact of being saved from sin or evil. The first part is God's part. It was the act of saving. The second part is ours. The fact of being saved. Potatoes or potatoes, right? Not at all. This is most probably one of the biggest risks to a believer. It's so subtle. It's so inconspicuous. You see, it's absolutely true. We are saved through faith. Yeah. We are saved through faith. In other words, we have a part in that. God did his part. He did the hard part. Mm -hmm. He sacrificed. He suffered. He died for us. We have the easy part. We believe. That's it. Amen. You believe. It's nothing greater. It's nothing more complicated than that. Believe. Ex just simply accept that he has given you a gift and that's it. Yeah. It's done and it's enough. Amen. Yeah. That's what you have to believe. But does it stop there? No. no. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't end because then you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. You will start exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. You start Loving when you used to hate. Yes. You start showing joy when you used to be angry. Yes. You start acting in gentleness, yes. in kindness, yes. instead of frustration, in uh -huh. impatience. Things start changing. You die to yourself. Mm -hmm. You start following His will. And not your own. In other words, you become a new creation. Yeah. Amen. Yes. That's the changes. Amen. But that's not the risk. Those things are all true. And they're wonderful. And they're necessary. Here's the risk. The part that, as your pastor, I, I, it challenges me every single time I make a sermon. How do I pass the message about the need to change without it becoming a message about works. It's tough. There's a fine line. It's a line that all pastors every Sunday deal with when they're trying to pass these messages. Because you see, you have a part in this. You must choose to accept the invitation of salvation. That's a choice. That's one of faith. When we do a call for salvation, 
You step out in faith and you say, I choose. I choose to accept you. And then we're told, you're told that you must change. And that's where it gets a little tricky. As soon as I tell you, you have to change, you start saying, okay, what do I got to do? All right, I'm ready. I'm ready for this change. What do I got to do? All right, I know I got to do this. I got to stop doing that. Yeah. Uh, I know I got to think this way. I got to stop thinking that way. I, 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 I. You see where it goes? Yeah. Uh-huh. It starts becoming about I. Yeah. Immediately. It's in your DNA. It's how you were raised. You were told from a little child that you need to do something and then you had to do it. Or you were told you need to think away or you were told that you need to stop being this way and you need to stop doing that way and you started doing it and that's how you were raised. The other response is that you hear a pastor tell you that it's not anything you can do. So you sit back and you wait. Okay, God, waiting on you. Can't wait to see what you're going to do in me today. Oh, this is going to be awesome. Just waiting. I'm ready, Lord. Do your thing. Here I am. Can you see the folly in both of those ways of thinking? I mean, the one way is, it's all about you. The second way is, I got no responsibilities in this. They're both false. They both have flaws. Like I said, it's tricky. It's challenging for a pastor. So I, I want to explain it in a way that I hope will, will help clarify a little bit. I hope it'll help you. The first is, you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. God's part provides salvation. Your part, accept it. Very simple. First step, simple. I think most people get the first step. Let's move to the second part. You are transformed by a renewing of your mind and you become a new creation. God's part, provide the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, guide you, convict you, encourage you, correct you. Your part, pray. Read your word. Meditate on your word. Concentrate on God. Serve others, Mm -hmm. not yourself. And when you do something, keep him in mind. Whatever it is, keep him in mind. You see, the change, the thing you need to do is you need to start focusing on God. That's the part. You got to focus on God and stop focusing on ourselves or on others. First and foremost, Him. You place your mind and thoughts on Him daily. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. That means just to focus on God in all you do. God's a part of your thoughts. When you go to work, God's a part of your thoughts. When you're in the car driving, especially when you're in the car driving, God's a part of your thoughts. You've got to be a part of your thoughts when you're doing anything. When you have a decision to make, you first seek Him. Then you seek your friends. Then you seek your spouse. Then you seek everybody else, right? Yeah. Seek Him first. In any decision making. When you have a problem, you go to God. That's the things we need to do. That's what changes us. Because as we focus on him, yes, he'll change you. But he changes you because now you're open to the change. You see? When you focus on you, you're not open to him changing you. You're figuring out how you're going to change you. But when you focus on God... Now you're open to that change. He can overcome anything in your life, but you have to be open to receive it. He will never force you. That isn't free will. That's dictatorship. 
We are redeemed because we accept the redemptive power of God Almighty. We can't redeem ourselves. Only He can do that. How does He do that? In Romans 3.24, Paul speaks of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And in Ephesians 1.7, he tells us that we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. As I stated, the audience of this book would have understand redemption. It was part of their law. But the New Testament shows redemption on a whole new level because it places Jesus on the cross as a redemptive act for all humanity. Point number two is his death was necessary. His death was necessary. We're going to turn to your reading in Hebrews chapter 9. We'll look at verses 16 to 22. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testament. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoyed unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now, the author is using the illustration of a will. And we're all familiar with, with wills. We know what those are, right? It reminds me of a story I heard. The attorney was gathering an entire family for the reading of the will. Relatives came from near and far to see if they were included in the bequest. The lawyer somberly opened up the, the will and began to read. To my cousin Ed, I leave my ranch. To my brother Jim, I leave my money and market accounts. To my neighbor and good friend, Fred, I leave my stocks. And finally, to my cousin George, who always sat around and never did anything, but wanted to be remembered in my will, I say, hi, George. <laughs> Wills are unique in that they require that the maker of the will be dead before they're any good. Right? I mean, up until the time of the death, a will can be changed. Many times. You could change that will every day if that's what you really wanted to do. Because it's not valid until the will maker dies. So they're really unique. It's their death that sets it into motion. And Christ's death set into motion the will and the covenant he had made. Yes. As a, with a will you or I would make, the beneficiaries sometimes have to meet requirements. We might say in our will that we choose to leave our house to our son. But he has to graduate high school first. If he doesn't graduate high school, the house gets sold and the money goes to the church. Yeah. That's a requirement of getting what you want from it, uh -huh. right? Well, God also had some requirements. And we talked about those in, our, in the first point. However, will has no value to the beneficiaries as long as the will maker is alive. It doesn't matter what's in that will. That will can say anything. You could be the richest person in the world. Let's take Bill Gates, for instance. I know he's not the richest, but he's close. Yeah. Bill Gates. Bill Gates could all of a sudden be coming through Homa, visit Victory of Homa, say, man, that's a good church. I like them people. I'm putting it in my will that when I die, all my money goes to Victory of Homa. Well, that's awesome. 
we'd be pretty excited. But it means nothing as long as he's alive. It's not until he's dead that the money comes and then he gets back home and his wife slaps him and tells him he's stupid and has to change the will back to his family. So that was cool for a while, but it didn't really mean anything, right? You have to have the will maker be dead first. That's what the author is arguing in this passage. Without death, Jesus Christ's death, it was impossible to receive the benefits of the covenant that God had made. And this, we, can, we can illustrate this. Let's use a credit card or a debit card as an illustration. You want to purchase something from somebody. And you want to, and they want money for that thing, right? So you could use cash or checks. It's the same illustration, but I think most people use cards nowadays. So we'll use credit cards. You tell somebody, let's say a gas station, or you go into a store, you go to a movie theater, whatever it is, you want something they have to offer. And they say, I'll give you this something. It'll cost you this amount of money. And you agree to that. So what do you do? You give them the credit card. You're tracking with me so far, right? All right? Okay. The card that you hand them, is it worth anything? No. It's a worthless piece of plastic. It's not the card itself that's worth anything. It's, it's no different than this water bottle that's made of plastic. Yeah. It's just a piece of plastic. So why is the person willing to give you the product or the service? Because it's what the card represents that has value. That person knows that that card, when he swipes it, will take the money that you have in your account and it will go into their account. So... It's not the card, that's just worthless plastic. It's the money that it represents. Christ's death upon the cross released payment that had been deposited by God from the beginning of time yeah. for all creation. His death is God's way of saying there's nothing in us worth saving mm -hmm. apart from Christ. These verses also show us that the old system, that system accomplished by man, was only a covering of sin. When they sacrificed animals, it just covered the sin for a period. And it had to be redone. Every year, had to be redone. Over and over. But Christ's blood was superior. He accomplished what the old covenant could not. He shed his blood. He gave his life for our sins so that we would not have to experience spiritual death or eternal separation from God. As long as I'm suffering to use my abilities to do something for God, it will never be acceptable because I am not indispensable from him. He is indispensable to me. Point number three, a very simple word, once. Our third point is simply once. We're going to continue to read on in Hebrews 23 to 28. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now the author of Hebrews has spent the first nine chapters talking to us and telling us about this greatness of Jesus Christ. And, and even in chapters 5 and 6, when we talked about our faith, it was still to show us the greatness of Jesus. Why do you think he spent so much time on that one subject? Well, the easy answer is that he was talking about God and God is worth it. But that's the easy answer about the whole Bible. That's what it all is about. I believe he spent so much time addressing Jesus and what he had done and why he had did it because he wanted to drive home this simple point that it is done. Amen. It is done. The point is culminated in these verses. The deed was done. It is finished. It need never be done again. I have mentioned a, a few times over the last four weeks how insufficient the old covenant was. Every sacrifice that was made was temporary. But what Christ did was not only sufficient, it was permanent. Mm -hmm. How long is that? Forever. Yes. Done. Finished. Yes. Never to be repeated again. How do we know that? Because of what happened afterward. Verse 24 tells us, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. This gives us three realities we can use in our lives. The first is the reality of our security with God. The reality of our security with God. You see, so often we worry about what other people think about us. And we have a tendency to transfer those perspectives uh, to God as well. We convince that if we make a mistake, he no longer welcomes us or wants us. Or worse, we conclude that he is out to get us. To, to pay us back for some recent mistake or a far off mistake. These verses give us security in our relationship with God. Jesus Christ, through his blood, makes us acceptable to come before God in the true tabernacle. His blood makes us acceptable. You get this. We are covered. We are redeemed. And we are free to come before the Lord. Yes. Because of His blood. Yes. We should have great security in that. Yes. Great security in that. Amen. His blood makes our worship acceptable. Yes. His blood makes our prayers acceptable. Yes. His blood makes our gifts acceptable. Yes. His blood makes our songs acceptable. His blood. When would this acceptance cease? When his blood is no longer acceptable. Can this happen? Well, let's look at number two. The reality of our stability because of Christ. The reality of our stability comes because of Christ. His sacrificial, sacrificial offering is complete. So to answer that question, can this happen? There is no need for another sacrifice because his first was the last. Amen. Yes. First and the last. His first sacrifice yes. was the last ever needed. Amen. There's no need for another because it atones once and for all. It's done. One of the things that many Christians struggle with is discouragement because of their sin. I know I have. Especially as you grow closer to God and then you fail, it can be a discouragement. Yes, yes. 
It can be discouraging. For some, it becomes a, a point of despair to think about their past. It's difficult to get them excited about serving God and enjoying the Christian life because they're convinced that God is angry with them or has given up on them. They can't get past their past. Life is generally becomes a roller coaster because of this discouragement. There's no stability in their relationship with God. My friends, there's great stability with God through the blood of Jesus. Amen. His sacrifice for our sin was for all time, once and for all. Past sin is covered. Future sin is taken care of. It's done. Amen. Three, the reality of our hope for the future. His coming return is certain. What two things are certain? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Two things that are certain. Death and taxes. Although we're not quite sure the tax one is. The writers of Hebrews uses this same idea to make a point to us. Just as certain that men die, so too is certain that Christ is coming again. Yes. For what reason is he coming again? It's not to deal with sin. Not to offer another sacrifice for sin. It's to gather his own. Both the dead in Christ and believers who are alive. What does that mean? That no matter the circumstances, I have no reason to fear or to worry. As the song says, I have a future in heaven for sure. In the meantime, I have the most powerful person in the universe on my side. They don't know who they're up against. If he wants it to happen, it will. And this is what it all comes down to. My sins are forgiven. I am accepted. And Jesus Christ is coming for me. All because of the blood that he shed for my sins. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. If you have never accepted this offer of redemption for your life, you've, you've fallen away and you just want to come back. You're ready to serve Him because He died for you. And you want to make that decision just raise your hand right now. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. We want to pray for these individuals that have made this choice. And so I ask that everybody repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. And today, I choose you to be my Savior. And I ask that you forgive my sins. That I am renewed by your wisdom as it applies to my life. I will follow your will and not my own. I ask for your strength and your wisdom to make the way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give him a round of applause. For those of you that, that made that decision, I, I want to invite you when we're done here, before you leave today, that to just join us in this room to the side. I just, I want 
we'll have some people in there. We just want to pray with you. Uh, see what kind of prayer needs you have and, and any questions you may have of what this decision means. We want to be with you on this journey and going forward, you are part of our family and, and we want to, to just help provide anything that you may need for that journey. But at this moment, I want to open up the altar. So if my prayer team would come forward, please. We're going to open up these altars for anybody that has a prayer need at all. Whether it's for yourself, a family member, friends, co-workers, whatever it is. And you just want someone to pray with you. We're going to ask that you come forward now. As the worship team plays another song, just come forward and, and let us pray with you. Jealous for me, and loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When 
sing that with me. And no. Oh,
We need to connect as families. We need to connect as a family of God, a church family. And we need to take that connection we form here and connect with our community and strengthen our community and be that beacon on the hill that calls the lost to be found. Just continue to pray for those who are in this congregation that have pain and suffering and, and are fighting the fight. It's hard when you're hurting to focus outside that pain. But God has the healing. And we just have the faith. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for every blessing you continue to rain down on us. So often we, we take for granted what is given, Lord. And where much is given, much is expected, Lord. And we need to turn and take those gifts and share it with the world. Not hold on to them selfishly. We need to show your love through every action of our day. Guide our actions through your love, Lord. Continue to bless this congregation, our church leadership, our pastor, and continue to instill a vision that you would have us in our purpose of life, Lord. In all this, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day.